Hi everyone, I hope you are all well. It's been, what, I think maybe another two weeks, I think, since my last review. <laughs> it's been it's been really busy. I've sort of been travelling around and been here, there and everywhere. So it's felt like that to me. Um, but yeah, it's I, I think it's been a couple of weeks. And, and I'm really, really happy because I've only got two more weeks of work and then I'm done for Christmas. Yay! And yesterday, or was it yesterday? No, the day before. Um, I finished my Christmas shopping. Oh my god, I never, I didn't intend to. I just thought I'm finishing work a bit early today. I might as well just have a quick half hour look around town. And suddenly I bought everything that I needed. Oh my god. So I'm really <laughs> glad that that's out of the way because it means that I can spend time, proper chunks of time reading. And that's what I did with the Kite Runner yesterday. I pretty much read two thirds of this book just yesterday um because i it'd been um as it'd been a couple of weeks i've been here there and everywhere traveling and everything so i haven't really had time to just sit and read so having the day free yesterday was absolutely wonderful uh yes so i am here to talk about the kite runner by kali hassini i hope i pronounced that right and if i haven't i apologize so this is the first book of uh kelly's that i have ever read of i believe it's his debut novel um and it's i i found it incredibly moving and powerful i'm really really glad that i read it uh definitely worth being on the 100 book bucket list um poster because you know how sometimes when you get one of those posters or, or you know something like that or somebody said right you've got to read or listen to xyz some of them can really disappoint you and i wasn't disappointed in the slightest with this book so what it is about uh it starts in 1975 with two 12 year old boys called amir and and hassan and they live in Afghanistan. Um, Amir lives quite a, a luxury kind of life, and Hassan is Hassan is actually the uh, son of their family servant. So the two boys live in the same house, but they're very, very different classes. Amir can read, he can write, he goes to school and everything. Hassan doesn't. And there's all of these various situations that happen throughout that, that period when they're about 12 years old. And one day to do with a, a kite flying tournament that will change kind of their relationship forever. Then jumps forward to 2001 and Amir is living in America. He's been there for since uh, the early to mid 80s. Uh, his family fled when various um, things were happening in, in the country and his aunt's family stayed there. And he is called back to Afghanistan and he learns a lot of things along the way and it's about his journey going back the things that he learns and it's very what I absolutely love about this book is that it's very much about father-son relationships uh, as well as social divides and I loved that what I really respect about this book as well uh, is that it's talking, it's set in and talking about a culture and a country that I know pretty much did this squat history wise about. I couldn't tell you um, what everyday kind of life is like that there, what happened with uh, the coup that happened in the 1970s, which triggers off uh, um, kind of the Taliban uh, rule and such, which is very prominent in this book. I couldn't tell you anything of that. So I'm really, really thankful to this book that it taught me the history. It taught me the language. It did it in such a simple um, way. And he throws in a lot of times he, he talks about, OK, this conversation, we were talking this language because there's different languages, you know, throughout Um Afghanistan and, and 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 such uh and that part of the world and he'll say right okay for this conversation we're speaking this language for this on the other and then a character might say should we talk in English from now on and then you know they go they go into English and he even though obviously those conversations in other languages are stated in English in the book because you know obviously um he has sentences or throws in a few words which are of that language and then translates them for you which I really liked because also um as I was reading because he does that from the very beginning 
I was able to uh, pick up on words and terms and such later on in the book, which he first introduced at the beginning of the book, and I knew exactly what that trans what that translated to. So yeah, as someone who doesn't know the history, doesn't know the languages, doesn't know dilly squat about it, um, about the culture and such of that part of the world. I ended up feeling quite comfortable reading um, reading this book and felt I could pick up, you know, certain terminology. And he actually refers to Amir when he's an adult, talks about learning English to um, a boy and says, you'll be able to pick up English really easy, <laughs> you know, once you once you get used to it um and as in a way the the english translation to these various languages uh which are which are spoken uh in afghanistan and such um i was able to pick on quite easily as well so i think it kind of shows you know from both sides that these languages are not as different as they seem um it's just i suppose a different perspective on on the world i suppose but uh yeah so that's basically what it's about this this man reflecting on his life uh writing about his life and everything and telling this story and my god what a story what a phenomenal story i absolutely adored those boys i absolutely adored uh Amir is a man. I love the fact that this book also, like I said, it looks at complex relationships of fathers and sons from various different social levels across many different societies because of, you know, society shifts and everything. Um, I love the fact that Amir is full of faults and he const and he talks about his faults and he gets frustrated when he hits block, uh, you know, brick walls and stuff. He gets... Um, he gets into moods he he's so relatable and what i love also about this world it's so visceral especially when you go into uh, afghanistan in 2001 because obviously because of conflicts and everything that happened and in, in that part of the world we kind of got used to seeing various locations and such on our TV screens, in in news and such, so I could I could visualize Afghanistan two thousand and one. Um, what well, as soon as you know got mentioned that he would go back as an uh, as an adult, I could picture it right away. When the nineteen seventies, I didn't know what that world would look like because I only knew it as you know this harrowing footage that we were seeing on the news. So the way in which Khalid brings it to life and Said and talks about the smells of the spices and the feeling of um, the heat on the, the cloth and the materials that people wear, the bright colours, the sun, the, the snow even. It sounds really stupid, but I never even thought about weather in that part of the world. It, 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 it's stupid, I know, but I never thought, oh my gosh, yeah, of course they would have snow. Why am I why wouldn't I think they would have snow? Um, you know, but I but I love the fact that he did that. It shone a light on a part of the world where I had one picture in my mind of what it would look like, which I got from the news, from, you know, worn torn images of this part of the world. I never saw it in a different light. And this book has shown it to me in a different light. And I absolutely love, love, love that. Um it's taught me a lot. It really has. And I tell you, you need your tissues. You need your tissues. I was crying quite a bit yesterday <laughs> reading this book. And it's not just like right at the end or right at the beginning. It's throughout. Your emotions are completely charged throughout. And you really feel everything that Amir feels. Um, and, oh my God, I absolutely adored Hassan. I, ah, uh, uh, oh, he was, like... There was this extraordinary bit where, uh, when they're children, Amir talks about a story uh, that he's writing about a man who's told that he can, uh, yeah, this this magical power or something, in order to turn his tears into pearls, and 
in his greed for want of the money, uh, he ends up filling a glass full of pearls from his tears um, while standing over the carcass of his of his dead wife with a bloody dagger in his hand. And Hazan's like, okay, why didn't he just cut an onion open and then that would make and put it under his eyes and that would make him cry? And Amir's really annoyed that he's kind of screwed up his story. But then at the same time, Hazan's just like, well, it's the logical thing to do, surely. I love that he saw the world from that perspective. He 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 was a, 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 this wonderful breath of fresh air and this kind of slice straight into these scenes and um, really changes that I, I just I adore that boy I absolutely adore him and uh, as an adult with his his letters are are wonderful absolutely wonderful but yeah um the ending bloody broke me I was so happy and I really felt the happiness in in Amir, um, the core of his being. He was finally at rest. He hasn't been at rest since he was 12 years old uh, because of a situation that happened the day, the kite um, tournament, which he'd never forgiven himself for. And I think now he can. And I like the fact that the book also ends quite open. Uh yeah, you know that they're going to be okay. He's going to take some time, but he's Amir's going to be okay now. He's at, he's his soul is kind of at rest with what he had gone through, and I'm really happy about that. Um, and I think he he'd be really excited about what was to come. And yeah, I just I can't help but being thinking what that now means for them i would it would be very interesting i know it it would never happen but it, it'd be very interesting if it was to be we'd hear something about amir later on in life and everything because the, the links and parallels and such throughout um the store the story from his earlier life with older male characters uh if we could have like an update <laughs> on amir and what that update would be I'd be very interested in that. It's exquisitely written, absolutely stunning, but it's so devastating at the same time. Uh, really, really kind of it, it is. It's a toughie to read. I'm not going to lie, and I'm not, and I don't mean because of blocks of information or how incredibly dark. It's not like it, it. It is very tough because of the context. The the dark stuff that you encounter and I don't mean dark as in we're going like to urban Welsh territory of like filth or anything like that I'm not that but you do get a lot of in your face violence happen and um I wanted to give an example of that um if I can find it uh ah here we go so this, uh, I'm only going to read a bit of this. It does have quite a graphic ending, but I just want to give a, a context of what I mean about the darkness of it. And then you can decide how you feel about that. And then for if you go on to read it. So this is Amir and his family are fleeing um, to, to, to get to the US. Uh, and they're going through... Um, various checkpoints and everything and they've just arrived in Pakistan and uh, this is him talking about something that he witnesses on their journey so Baba and I hurried to the pack of onlookers and pushed our way through them Kamal's father was sitting cross-legged in the centre of the circle, rocking back and forth. Kamal and, and his father are one of the two of the people that are with them and tons of other people trying to, to flee. So he's rocking back and forth, kissing his son's ashen face. He won't breathe. My boy won't breathe, he was crying. Kamal's lifeless body lay on his father's lap, his right hand uncurled and limp, bouncing to the rhythm of his father's sobs. My boy, he won't breathe. Allah, help him breathe. Baba knelt beside him and curled an arm around his shoulder. But Kamal's father shoved him away and lunged for Karim, who was standing nearby with his cousin. What happened next was too fast and too short to be called a scuffle. 
Carrie muttered a surprised cry and backpedalled. I saw an arm swing, a leg kick. A moment later, Kamal's father was standing with Karim's gun in his hand. Don't shoot me, Karim cried. But before any of us could say or do a thing, Kamal's father shoved the barrel into his own mouth. I'll never forget the echo of that blast or the flash of light and the spray of red. I doubled over again and dry heaved on the side of the road. So as you can see, uh, sorry if uh, that upset anyone, but as you can see, that, that's what I mean, how you get this, these sudden um, violence acts that happen. Um, it is very shocking. It is right in your face. And there are lots of other stuff that comes later on in the book, Revelations, when, when he... Um, when uh, Amir goes back to Afghanistan uh, in 2001, uh, which includes uh, deaths at a stadium, which again, you know, are harrowing scenes that we uh, have seen on the news since about, what, 2003? Uh, you know, those kind of things. So, I, I'm trying. I'm trying to describe it without giving stuff away, but I just to make you understand. And so, you know, you probably know the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. And we do get a full-on witness account of those kind of things happening. So there is violence. There is, you know, lots of things going on. But the one thing I just, I, I just that just shines is beauty. It really does, um, you know. I, I, and these kind acts that are so human, and I feel, I felt like I was right in there in that moment. Um, so I want, I want to give another example. This is a longer one. This is the last week I'm going to do. It's a couple of pages long, and basically, Amir has gone back to Afghanistan now, uh, and he has a driver uh called very and uh the, he, he's been staying with his driver's family and but the family he's overheard you know kind of conversations and and such and they 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 they're, they're starving there's no food around and yet he's a guest that hasn't he's been given food and all this lot and um this is him kind of talking about uh them just before they go off to to go where they need to go so, I stepped outside, stood in the silver tarnish of a half moon and glanced up to a sky riddled with stars. Crickets chirped in the shuddering darkness and a wind wafted through the trees. The ground was cool under my bare feet and suddenly, for the first time since we were across the border, I felt like I was back. After all these years, I was home again, standing on the soil of my ancestors. This was the soil on which my great-grandfather had married his third wife a year before dying in the cholera epidemic that hit Kabul in 1915. She bore him what was his his first two wives... Sorry, she'd borne him what his first two wives had failed to, a son at last. It was on this soil that my grandfather had gone on a hunting trip with King Nadir Sa and shot a deer. My mother had died on this soil. And on this soil, I had fought for my father's love. I sat against one of the house's clay walls, the kinship I felt suddenly for the old land. It surprised me. I mean, gone long enough to forget to be forgotten. I had a home in a land that might as well have been on another galaxy to the people sleeping on the other side of the wall I leant against. I thought I'd forgotten about this land, but I hadn't. And under the bony glow of a half moon, I sensed Afghanistan humming under my feet. Maybe Afghanistan hasn't forgotten me either. I looked westward and marveled that somewhere over those mountains, Kabul existed. It really existed, not just as an old memory or as the heading of an AP story on page 15 of the San Francisco Chronicle. Somewhere over these mountains in the west slept the city where my hair-lipped hair brother and I ran kites. Somewhere over there the blindfolded man from the dream had died a needless death. Once over those mountains I had made a choice. And now, a quarter of a century later, that choice has landed me right back on this soil. I was about to go back inside when I heard voices coming from the house. I recognised one of the wines. Nothing left for the children. 
We're hungry, but we're not savages. He's a guest. What was I supposed to do? He said in a strange voice. To find something tomorrow. She sounded near tears. What do I feed? I tiptoed away. I understood now why the boys hadn't shown any interest in my watch. They hadn't been staring at the watch at all. They'd been staring at my food on my plate. We said our goodbyes early the next morning. Just before I climbed into the Land Cruiser, I thanked Walid for his hospitality. He pointed to the little house behind him. This is your home, he said. His three sons were standing in the doorway watching us. The little one was wearing the watch. It dangled around his twiggy wrist. I glanced in the side view mirror as we pulled away. Walid stood surrounded by his boys in a cloud of dust whipped up by the truck. It occurred to me that in a different world, those boys wouldn't have been too hungry to chase after the car. And earlier that morning, when I was certain that no one was looking, I did something I had done 26 years earlier. I planted a fistful of crumpled money under a mattress. So as, as you can see, that he's very, he's so poetic with his, his sentence structures. How that beginning of that section is quite, mysterious and kind of airy and flowy and then it turns quite sinister and dark but then there's the hope at the end the fact that he's he's taken he's got loads of cash so he's just shoved it in the mattress rather than handing it straight over he's gone right hide it in the mattress they're gonna find it and they can't give it back to me because i won't be around and it means that they can have food and uh and everything and i love that the generosity in a quiet moment uh, for a family who is starving in the middle of a war that, you know, well, that they, they can't get out of. I loved, love, love that. So, um, yeah, I absolutely fell head over heels in love with this book. Would I read it again? Yes. Uh, will I look up any other of books of this author? Yes. Would I recommend this to everyone? Yes, yes, yes. Loved it. Um, it's beautiful. I think it's one of those stories that a debut novel, my God, stunning. Um, but it's one of those stories that it's not just, wow, that's a great debut novel. Let's see what else they do. This is a debut novel that sticks to you. It really sticks. Uh into your heart, into your soul. Um, Hazan's going to be living in my heart and soul for a while, as well as Amir, but especially Hazan. I, I loved, love, love, love that that boy and that man. Um, what he represents, his love, his heart. He, he, oh God, he's amazing. Um, I really would like to read his other books as well. Um, and yeah, I really strongly recommend it. Now, there was a film made of The Kite Runner back in 2007. I never got to see it. I remember when it got released. I remember seeing the trailer and everything. Um, but it never came to the cinema where I lived. Um, at the time, we didn't have the big city world that we have now. So it was a, it was a really old kind of rundown cinema. and just never really came so, to the area where I live. So... I finished this last night, so last night I was like, okay, I'm going to have a look, see what's on Netflix, see if I can watch the film. It's not available in the UK. They have it on Amazon Prime. I have Netflix. I don't have Amazon Prime. Girl. So that's another that's another one <laughs> film that I'm going to have to watch outside of the review kind of time, as it were, and everything, and see if I can yeah, get hold of a copy. But I've looked at the official movie clips that they have on like YouTube, where they have like nine or ten clips from the film, and I have to say, it's pretty good. The 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 clips that I've seen really close to the book, so I'm really happy about that. Um, and strangely, the boy who plays Hazan looks exactly how I I visualised him in my in my head as I was reading it. So that was quite spooky <laughs> seeing this kid on the, on the screen. He looks just like the boy in my head. Um, but I love that. Uh, I really, really do. So um, I can't give you a review of the film since I've not seen it. But based on the clips that I have seen, it looks fantastic. Um, looks just as I, I imagined, 
um, the casting is great and I really love those clips so I'm really really looking for a copy of it now uh, don't know I might I might uh, buy it as a treat my, for myself for Christmas we'll see um, but anyway, yes, uh, please read this book if you're able to. Um, I really, really strongly recommend it. So, those are my, my thoughts of The Kite Runner. If you read this book, I'd love to know what you think. Leave me a comment in the comments box below or give me a thumbs up, thumbs down, tell it to you like you decide. I've already announced what the next book I'm going to read is, which is A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. I'm going to be starting that tomorrow. I am so super excited for that. And yeah, hopefully now, because Christmas shopping is such as done for me um i will uh hopefully be back possibly next weekend with my review of tale of two cities mm, we'll see how i go um but yeah i'll uh, i'll see you guys later bye